Welcome to Fanboy Nation's very first Sci-Fi Writers Roundtable. Today joining me are Robert Davies, Lexi Wolf, Caitlin Brook, and a close friend of mine, Gary Morgenstein. How are you guys doing today? Great. Doing great. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting time that we're living in. And, uh, you know, we have the coronavirus going on. We have this world pandemic and sci-fi has been a, a huge predictor of wars, of science fiction, of pandemics. Uh, the first movie that always pops into mind when something like this goes on for me is The, a the Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, what were some of the influences for you four writers and why do you think that sci-fi is so prevalent in being able to warn us to prepare for these pandemics, yet we never do? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> let's see. For me, I think sci-fi basically just, it kind of is like basically looking into the future and basically no one ever listens to the predictors because it's like, oh, that'll never happen. Everybody's always positive that nothing will ever happen. Yeah. Science fiction asks questions that nobody else asks, but it also entertains possibilities that are right here, right now, largely impossible. Mm -hmm. It opens up a gate, that creative gate leads to any and all possibilities. There are very few rules. You can, in science fiction, you can do whatever you want with the fiction. You can't goof around with the science that much, but that is a leavening agent and it, it keeps us relatively centered but we're allowed wide latitude and when the imagination examines the current condition and spools up about the future all all holds or no holds barred all bets are off yeah and we could also be reassuring um within the asking the what if because you know um and setting up this um you know, unsettling the readers and and scaring the readers sometimes but also by showing them through our characters, ultimately, that um, just regular folks caught up in the, in the horror and the nightmare who somehow are heroic or not, but they get through and it gives them, it, it could be hopeful. Unless it's like, you know, um, Childhood End by Arthur C. Clarke, then it's not so hopeful, but, <laughs> but at the end, it, it, it's about the human spirit. And I think that science fiction writers going back to the golden age have always been about the people. Showing that resilience, definitely, I agree. All right. Caitlin, you look like you're going to get tired holding the phone up the whole time. It's all right. I'm, <laughs> I'm used to holding a 20 pound baby, so it's, oh, this right. is nothing. <laughs> well, the phone's not wiggling on you. No, it's not. So it's actually much nicer. <laughs> How do you find the time to write then when you have a 20 pound baby in your arm most days? Nap time. I am very <laughs> strict about nap time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, you know, we've all been influenced, whether it's Star Trek or it's, you know, Fahrenheit 451 or whatever it is. What were some of the books that were like the gut puncher, like, this is my world. This is where I need to be. And this is the type of fiction I need to be writing. For me, I was actually inspired by more horror because I, I tend to write more darker sci-fi, darker fantasy. Um, and some of the books that really got me it was Imaginary Girls by Nova Ren Suma. And I also really liked uh, Forest of Hands and Teeth by Carrie Ryan. Um, the Forest of Hands and Teeth, that's definitely a, more zombie, but zombies are sci-fi. And I mean, that just putting yourself in that world of like isolation, it's pretty much what we're dealing with right now. And going back, when I was writing it, I just loved that the, basically the whole unknown and building that slow suspense and it's really the suspense that gets everyone crazy it's not oh you know there's a horde outside my house there's the, well maybe there's going to be something and what's this horde like you can look at the horde and then it, it's just those lingering questions about what's going to happen and that's kind of like the state that we're in and that's how my writing is is basically I try to do a lot of suspense <laughs> And Lexi, what about you? Um, well, for me, I'm a little bit on the weirder side. It's like I generally get inspired by uh, movies and that movies and TV shows for sci-fi. Not so much the books, too much. Um, my the only book that I really 
really liked for sci-fi was uh, Mind Transfer mm-hmm. by uh, uh, Janet Asimov, I think. And uh, But the movie that inspired me for Ravenhawk was uh, Robocop, the original one, not the remake nonsense. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about in regards to a RoboCop remake. I that's been memory wiped. <laughs> block that, <laughs> block yeah. that one out. Yeah, it's like I don't blame you. That, that was a, a travesty. <laughs> like it might have been fine for what it was if they didn't call it RoboCop. Yeah, that's what I feel with a lot of remakes and reboots. Oh, definitely. But yeah, it, it's one of those. For basically, I tend to look at technology and basically that our technology is kind of our part of our evolution. Mm-hmm. And it's one of those I would prefer to see that humans and our what we create can coexist and not destroy each other. So mo- most of my focus is trying to figure out if humans actually could coexist and exploring that. Well, we get a dose of that every uh, 60 to 120 years. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Gary, we'll throw the question to you, and then we'll have Robert round it out. Well, I think um, writers like uh, Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov, I loved Philip K. Dick, because I loved his madness. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, You know, the disconnection, the the disenchantment, the fact that the world is coming together or coming apart, and exactly what's going on, and what's my role in it, and I love that sort of... uh, and and that came to be also influenced by um, the first Star Trek. I am, you know, an original Enterprise guy. Sorry, I'm sure other ones are good if I've ever watched them. But so it's a, uh, you know, you know the the, the so blending all together the social aspects. Mm-hmm. I am not techie. Um, I can possibly write a little tech, but I can't possibly explain it because I would go down the rabbit hole. And I'm amazed when people can write that. So I really focus on. Um, social issues and world building more or world collapsing more. Right. <laughs> yeah. Whereas Gary is with the fun stuff. What about you, Robert? <laughs> I think me out of my intellectual lethargy was Brave New World. When I read that and discovered how long ago Huxley wrote it, it, it was a, that was a game changer. Fahrenheit 451 got my attention too, but Gary's right. If it has Asimov or Bradbury attached to it, uh, or Philip K. Dick come to that, I'm going to read it and have uh, Heinlein to a, a fairly large uh, extent. But I was a, I was also a Star Trek original baby, and watching that show Sunday night launched me off onto a million flights of fancy. But I think I got serious about science fiction really uh, when I read Brave New World. That was I stumbled on it and. And I thought it was ridiculous title and then I read it and everything changed. And that was really where that incubation process began. Mm-hmm. With, with the genre itself of science fiction, you know, a lot of it can play into whether it's conspiracy theories or whether it's uh, social ills or world problems. Um, do you guys get your inspiration from like, let's say shows like ancient aliens. I'm addicted to that show because They'll use just enough history and just enough theology to, to pull you in. And then just before the commercial break, they'll say ancient astronaut theorists say whatever. And then they go off into conspiracy theory land. Like, do you ever hear conspiracies or hear these weird notions and go, that would make for a great novel or that would make for a great short story? I'm, I'm antithetical toward them. I, I tend to attack conspiracy theory every chance I can get. I'm very combative. There's an explanation for pretty much everything. And, you know, you don't have to go to Roswell to figure out we're likely not alone in the universe. But, you know, telling me that, that a balloon magically turned into an alien spaceship as a cover from the evil government was a bit much to take. So I don't personally. Okay. Well, you can see why maybe um, the governments haven't discussed the contacts with UFO when we had the hysteria over the virus originally. You know, just imagine if the world governments had said, showed pictures of, you know, the president with an alien ambassador from Planet Z. Social media would have melted down. I know Caitlin writes, uh, includes social media (laughs) in in her novels, but um, I think the world is so dysfunctional. And, you know, all you have to do is go on Twitter or social media and you go, what? 
because a lot of times you don't even know if it's real, if it's all bogus. And I think we should just sometimes just step back from conspiracies and just look at the people mm -hmm. and what they do daily to, for inspiration. Yeah, exactly. I, I couldn't agree more, Gary. With, with social media, I mean, everything's just completely blown out of proportion. And someone will say one thing. I've even noticed it like with some of my tweets lately. I just, I do like daily prompt tweets. You know, they give you a word, you create a story. I've created a story and obviously at least the prompts have been, you know, quarantine or second wave. And I've just made up some stories and people have contacted me and they're like, is this going to happen? Where did you hear this? And I'm like, it's fake. It's not real. Like, it's a story. So, it, and especially with, you know, being a sci-fi writer and like we were saying before, how people, they just come to you and they're like, do you know something? Is, is the government hiding something? How do you know this? And no, it, it's, it's not, it. we're just creative. I don't know. <laughs> but like, you're right. It's social media. It's so quickly gets out of hand. And that's, that's where we need to step back. Like you were saying. In my, in my last novel, In the Mount Over Hell, um, in the America of the dystopian America, um, all social media is banned under the Anti-Narcissism Act. So. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'll vote for that. The Anti-Narcissism That's really that's like, a service to humanity right there, what, Gary. What about thinking you actually have to have real friends, not what? you know the 2,000 people on Facebook, you, you know, go. or the Twitter, they're, they're, you know, they're not gonna come in the middle of the night and, and help you when you're crying no. hysterically over some terrible loss, right? Right. Gary, well, Gary's problem. moving in three weeks and he's tweeting out, you know, for, for, <laughs> for help with the, uh, the new apartment. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I think like the biggest thing with social media, and this is what I talk about a lot in my novel, is just that constant need for validation. And someone has a thought, they put it up on Twitter or Facebook and it gets three likes. They suddenly become super depressed full of anxiety because, oh, people don't like me. People don't, I, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I, I better, I better post something else. And their brain is just jumping and leaping so, so fast that they're trying to think of what can I do? What can I put up that's going to get them to like me, get them to notice me? Instead of living in the present, they are so far gone trying to think of the next big thing that they, they miss out. And it, so this is, it's happening so many, so many places over the past 10 years, phone usage has just exploded and it's so sad and it's everyone, it's grandparents, it's toddlers, it's, you know, people like just everyone, everyone is using it 24 seven. And just the facts that I found about like addiction and, you know, people going to rehab for cell phone use, it's ridiculous. I just, I'm very passionate about that. So <laughs> the, the addiction angle is what spurred uh, my, uh, the book. I think actually you might've read it, Caitlin, that, that, uh, when the river ran dry, it's called, yes. and that was an addiction to tech. And that was, it, it, she's exactly right. It's, I, I saw the entire story motivated and driven by an irrational and hopeless addiction to it really advanced entertainment technology, which is what social media really is. Yeah. That was a fact. So, but why is this happening? I mean, why do we think this is happening? Uh, a lot of, I think because in, in large measure, you are, you are given a tool, a toy, but with it an expectation. There's a social construct that comes along with something and you can take it with you in your hand and your phone. And now you have, um, uh, uh, 20 million people potentially who are going to see and hear you. And it's, I think it's, it is uh, narcissism on parade. Hear everybody, listen to me, look what I have to say. Like anybody gives a shit. I don't, but there's a lot of people who do and they want you to see their little world and, and look in and pat them on the back and agree with them. And yes. uh, it's, it's horribly misused technology in my judgment. But don't you think once we've reached the point of realizing that there's algorithms and there's certain word choices or certain codes that we have to use in order to get these followers, that people are either attuning themselves to this addiction and being manipulated 
into going that route? I mean, a very 1984 sense mm. of newspeak in, a, in essence. But it's not just Twitter. I mean, look at all the people who are playing games mm. on their phone constantly. They're constantly <laughs> all those crushing candy. candy. Babble and yeah, crushing candy. Yeah. Come it's, on. So, it's so dumb. Go outside, play with your children, look up from your phone, get out a board game, get a book. It's just shocking. Go outside How after you've read everybody's book in this in this conversation. Right. <laughs> exactly so. Or read their book under a tree. Oh. <laughs> Jennifer Aniston said that they could never do friends again because friends would not be sitting in a coffee shop talking. They would just be on their phone, like you say. Right. But then you and could never do The Fugitive again either. <laughs> <laughs> no one armed man. I don't know. I, 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 I'm... I lament it and I, I hope it doesn't come across as strictly a generational thing. I'm not beating on, on younger people for whom this is a daily and in, inextricable uh, instrument of their social construct. I'm not, um, but I, I, I worry about what they're going to be in their future when something new comes along. Will they have to adjust one addiction for another? Are they going to be so socially crippled that out in the street with other people becomes intolerable to them? I don't know. It's a, it, speaking of, of theories, there's one now. We don't know what the cultural impact of this is going to be. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. Alexa, you're, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Caitlin. Sorry. I was just going to say one more thing. No, I, I totally agree just because I, I run a daycare and these children come into my home and before like they start they just sit there because they don't know how to play and these are one and a half to three year olds and they don't know how to play without a screen in their hand or a tablet pinging in front of them every four seconds and you see it it's become it like a new babysitter parents out shopping they just give their two-year-old a phone because oh well they'll be quiet no, like that's not what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to be engaging with them, and teaching them. And th with the phone, it's just this like blocker that they just, the kids just zone out and they don't know, they can't have a, a, I don't know, an original thought for themselves without it being flashed on the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to throw that same same idea to Lexi because she's been a little quiet for right now, but Robert had mentioned <laughs> not not social interacting. But since you're a bit more of a movie buff, uh, the movie Surrogate with Bruce Willis, how everyone was using a physical avatar to be out in the streets. And then once the system shut down, they all had to get out of the house and learn how to re react and interact with other people. Um, do, you th do you see us getting to that point? Not only do we have the avatar on a screen, you know, our best pictures up on, on Instagram or whatever, and things of that sort that are leading to not wanting to leave the house anymore. Like I, I am an introverted extrovert, so I can be outgoing and charismatic and talk to people. And then I can be at home for three weeks and not talk to anybody at once. So that's just my natural personality. But what's this going to do to social interaction, especially with this quarantine that we're all facing now? Um, I could honestly see that we might gravitate towards that simply because of this virus and probably other things that will eventually crop up. Hold on a second. Cat. Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's being lovey. Yeah. Um, but as I, for me, it's, it's a little bit different for me because it's, it's one of those, I've never really mastered social media. I'm not a talker. I tend to be the person who just sits there and listens to everybody. <laughs> um, most of my social interaction used to be on uh, text-based games called Muxes or Moos or Mushes. And we used, it was more or less cooperative writing. So we do role-playing and things like that. And most of my friends are long distance, but it's only because uh, most of my friends are like overseas or on the other side of the country. So I kind of regard them as people. And I only have like a few. I'm not like trying to get numbers in that because... I couldn't keep track of them anyway. But I think some of the problems is people just don't really know how to interpret the digital medium into a person. They just don't see it that way. 
It's one of those that you have to be physically present or it's just a thing on a screen and they don't really consider it a real person. I see. Um, do you think that comes along with people shouting each other down or, or being nasty to each other on the internet? Because nine, nine, of, nine out of 10 of these people would never say anything like this to somebody's face. They used to not say things like that to people's faces. I think that they, people have started to do things to people's faces because before it used to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. So you could have, you know, your public face in real life being the nicest person on the planet and on online, you're the toxic person that just would basically be this most horrible human being ever. And I think some people eventually, it's like once you started having a real identity and that some, it started migrating off of the internet. So you have horrible people who don't hide themselves anymore. And I think mm. that's a, that's a bad development in myself to me because it's like if they were still anonymous or you could basically make it a bad thing, then maybe you know peer pressure would push people off from doing that stuff. But right now it's just like allowed, and so they just run rampant. Well, that's an old school punch to the face would be uh, would be helpful sometimes. Very cathartic too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, with everything going on, you know, we, we've, we've touched upon, you know, the negatives of, of social media and social interaction. But with this quarantine that we're going through now, um, you know, houses of worship have had to go online because no more than 10 people can gather in public. Um, it's given us a chance to increase our communities, though, whether if you're a religious person or you believe in spirituality or philosophy groups or whatever else it is that we're using, I mean, we're using Zoom right now to have the five of us clear across the country from, from each other, interacting and discussing this topic. So there are some good things that are coming of this. Um, what can we learn from this quarantine that's going to be helpful to us uh, once the next wave hits? Because after World War I, life changed, and that was the new normal. After World War II, that was the new normal. After you know, everything that's going on, it becomes the new normal. What tends to become our new normal with this? I see telecommuting becoming a big thing in the future and that it's going to be better for corporations where I'll look at political aspects where both sides will win. You know, one side wants it more eco-friendly and far less commuting. The other side will realize, oh, well, if they work from home, we're going to save a ton of money on renting the building and utilities. So I see it, you know, I see that being a benefit of all of this. Yeah, but there's an exacerbate. I mean, when they talk about us being um, self-isolated, as, as we all have acknowledged, we already are self-isolated through social media. Mm -hmm. There already is uh, a d diminution of real contact with people. If we get, instead of coming out of our shells and finding more real um, human relationships as reflected in literature, for example, maybe a little less CGI in movies and more about just people, um, otherwise we're just going to keep scurrying down the rabbit hole of just relying on technology instead of relationships. That's what I, I, I agree with them. I think this is uh, uh, interaction between people is devastated by definition. When you're expected to separate from people that you otherwise would interact with people at work or in sports and uh, entertainment venues, places of worship as well. If that is shifted to an electronic approach, then you really have uh, put another nail in the coffin of a communal society, one that interacts regularly. There is a, a reason for the, that undefinable quality of humanity that when, you, when everybody stopped shopping downtown and started shopping at shopping malls because they could, that had an impact. Nobody saw it. Nobody cared, but it was there. In this instance, we're looking at that all over again on a gigantic, literally global scale. Mm -hmm. will, will people take advantage of it for their own purposes? Sure. I'm not, not sure all of them are good. I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not a humanist. I'm, I'm an isolationist myself, but that's temperament. That's not logic. I don't, I don't see any good coming from separating humanity from humanity in the long run. I also think it's also going to impact just human nature. You're not going to trust anyone. Like after this, we're still, we're going to continue to do that social distancing. 
we're going to continue to, you know, hoard things. And just in case this ever happens again, everyone's going to be prepared. It's going to be like those doomsday preppers that everyone are, would laugh about, but they're the ones who are sitting back, not worried now. Right. And <laughs> <laughs> all these, like, you're not going to trust people. You're going to, you know, keep your distance. You're not going to let yourself be vulnerable around others because you're going to be too busy protecting yourself and trying to survive, even though there might not be a threat. So as, as they were saying, I, I definitely think it's going to just, I don't think it's going to be good. <laughs> Gary and I are both old enough to remember diving underneath the, the desk at yeah. school and That's right. the air raid sirens going off and that was a part of life when the Red Scare was still open for business. And it, it created lots and lots of hoarding became the, a way of life. And most people did. They didn't maybe didn't build the elaborate shelters, but they had a whole bunch of stuff in the basement or in the attic or somewhere that they could get to it when the Soviet Union decided to incinerate us. That had a real big effect. I don't know that it's terribly different this time, but it took decades for that to ease off. So I think you'll see an immediate long term, maybe not technology is different now and it is the driver, not supposition and and fear of the unknown. We know exactly precisely what this is. We don't have to wonder. I mean you, you think about some people have compared this to not to nine eleven, which is vastly different because that um, was about a specific enemy and there was a sense of empathy across the country with us without discussing politics per se. But with this it's every country for itself. Right. And you wonder if the, and, and I understand, and I'm not d disputing closing borders and in quarantining and keeping it, it separate, but will that stop? Will the suspicion stop? Or will that then become something of a, a, normal, a normality that yes, let's keep those people away? Because we know when it comes to um, moments of plague, I mean, the bubonic plague in the 14th century killed almost half of Europe and the, the Jews were blamed for it and they were killing, you know, and, and, and you get on and on. I mean, I've already, you know, the nonsense, don't eat Chinese food, don't drink Corona beer. Well, I, I know it's absurd, but there is an undercurrent of that. And I wonder if once people go out on the streets and I hear, you know, living in New York, you know, you hear the instances of, of Asian people being attacked. You know, thank goodness not en masse because everyone is, is being, you know, semi-quarantined. But you just wonder, will this, when will the suspicions, as Caitlin was talking about, subside and will they get ugly or just uneasy? I mean, will you want to go to a baseball game and sit next to someone? You know, will There's they a science stuff? fiction story or 12 running around in this narrative, isn't there? Right. Sorry? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, how many of you are secretly taking notes in your head? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that the next story is coming from this. <laughs> Caitlin's writing it down right now. <laughs> Lexi would be if the cat wasn't in her lap. Yes. Uh, actually, he moved off. Um, for me, it's like I actually kind of think that our technology might evolve because we want our human contact and that. Because mm -hmm. in Ravenhawk, I have a thing where people can actually plug into the internet and interact there. And I could see something like that coming about if we get a technological um, jump ahead. It's like with they're like figuring out like quantum stuff with computers and that. Mm -hmm. If we can figure out how to basically plug ourselves in, we'd be able to interact in a semi-physical way without, you know, having to actually be physically present. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, it's like because we're going to have that need, I think that might be a driver for the technology that actually to evolve. But wouldn't that cause even more problems because there was that guy in Korea that was a gamer that spent four days straight, didn't go to the bathroom, didn't eat, didn't drink water and died at his computer because he was so engulfed in there. You know, what there, happens there's when always, we got to take a break and eat or go to the restroom or whatever else. But, but that is part of the, the problem with the evolution is some people are going to adapt well to it. Some are not. And you have to see what the potential dangers are to be able to try to address them before they become a problem. That's part of the whole pro point of science fiction is to kind of basically like, going, hey, here's some potential problems you might want to look at and deal with them before they become a problem. I touch on something very similar in Wired. Um, the technology is advanced enough that you don't hold it in your phone. It's attached to the base of your neck and it is 
the images are portrayed through your occipital lobe. So you see a half screen so you can exist, you know, go about your daily life. But then on this other half, you can constantly be uploading to social media, constantly be, you know, talking to someone, seeing something, doing something, putting yourself out there. So you're having, essentially they pitch it as like the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. But then what happens when you isolate yourself from the real world in favor of just that virtual world and that's how i kind of go into the addiction and like you said most like sometimes it doesn't affect people but for those people that it does affect it affects them hard and that's <clears throat> i think ultimately what's going to happen right well disney touched on this with the animated feature wally where everyone was just fat and lazy <laughs> in a recliner <laughs> watching the screen and then somebody gets bumped and goes wait a minute there's more to this than just the screen uh what's the bump that we need now uh, once this quarantine is over to get away from our screens at least for an hour, two hours, three hours a day. Cause some of us work behind a screen, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day. I would imagine there's going to be a, 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 a bit of a cultural social reckoning. I'm not convinced that, that the bump is going to be paid attention to. I, 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 I I'm afraid that once the, the gate is open and the quarantines are lifted and we're supposed to go back to our original lives. I don't think that it will shock people into saying, now, wait a minute, I'm going to deliberately veer off from the way I used to live my life because I've learned a lesson. No, I don't think so. I think they're going to say, get me back to where I was because I'm safe and happy there and I don't have to think and I don't have to do. Don't make me do that shift, that fundamental shift. I think that takes decades if not centuries of social evolution i don't think they're going to do it now i think they're just going to be grateful they get to do what they were doing before and pretend it never happened mm -hmm. exactly and you need to continue the continued risk changes behavior once it's over as robert says people go oh, it's over done right let's go back to how it was right Sadly. i think right i think right now though we're going to have to have a second wave of this uh pandemic hitting us because we're gonna go through the first one. If we get through it without any repercussions, they'll just be like, oh, everything's normal. Yeah. But if they lift everything early and we get a second wave of massive infections and hospitals getting overwhelmed because we, weren't, we still couldn't catch up, I think that will basically be a real impact on society right. because it's like they won't be able to deny it anymore. Yeah, well, I was having that conversation this morning where I said, if they let us out by Easter, and it goes back to business as usual, we're going to have another huge spike. And then we're stuck in quarantine again till Thanksgiving. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's not going to, it's not fast enough to alter human, human behavior and alter human reasoning. Mm -hmm. Like w there's going to be a second wave. We're all going to come out of quarantine and we're all going to go back to exactly what we were doing. Yeah. We'll just have a bottle of Purell next to us, but everyone's still going to do the same thing. Right. And I, it's it's not humans aren't evolved enough to look at their situation and say oh I, to avoid this in the future i'm gonna do this we're not smart enough yet and the culture as a whole the public as a whole we, we can't do it it's not going to work at least not might change in south korea and italy south yeah. koreans are far more disciplined than we are italians are far more reactionary than we are but this is a continental country 350 million people you have 40 or 50 million people, you can get them to do something a lot right. easier than you can to get us to do something. We don't change easy in America. And it's easier to say, well, I'm glad we weren't Italy, but we weren't. So here's me going back to what I was doing before. Right. They would take we had those people a million dead. That. Yeah. But we have those people that decided to throw a coronavirus party and then got sick with the coronavirus in Kentucky. <laughs> you know, Darwin is saying, yeah. excellent, <laughs> every time he sees stuff like that. Yeah. yeah the the problem know. is, is the people who do know how to deal with this and would deal with this are going to have to interact with the people who are idiots. Right. But it yeah. goes back to that old tale of the ant and the grasshopper. The ant worked all, all spring, all summer, all fall to take care of the winter. The grasshopper played his, his, uh, his guitar the whole time. The ant helped him out, and then spring came, and he didn't learn his lesson and went back to you know, playing his guitar when he was starving uh, till the ant helped him. Yeah, they don't, they take it for granted. Like, yeah. not gonna learn, yeah. 
you know, I there's mean, a lot of grasshoppers. <laughs> well, America is, you know, built on rebellion. You know, our whole mindset is, you know, I'm going to do it and screw you if you don't like it. But I think, you know, how do we get back? And this is going to be a slightly a political question. How do we get past this partisanship where going, well, the governor is on the other team. So clearly he's lying to me about this unseen, uh, you know, attack that's coming my way. And now I'm just going to be rebellious against him because he's on the opposite team. You don't, you don't get rid of it. We are too far along that path. Yeah. You will, you will, we are as uh, a split into two and the, the gulf between the left and the right used to be a wide area that was intermingling. It's a sharp divide now. And that gulf is as wide as it can be. There's nothing in between. I have no faith people on, uh, uh, on uh, I'm not going to get political, but I don't have any faith that that will not hold sway for a long time. That is generational because it's taken generations to get to a point at which people are indoctrinated by things that maybe aren't in their best interest and they didn't stop to think or say no. Maybe they couldn't. But I think we're way too far gone to expect people to do that. They're going to attack what they disagree with. It's dogmatic as hell. There's another book story, uh, a storyline for a book. I'm sure I should be jotting this stuff down. I'm really, anyway. Uh, Don't no, worry, I'll, I, I'll send I, you the link when it goes live so you can. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we get there. I think it takes, it, it takes a million dead, irrespective of who's in control for who's in control being irrelevant, which is the way it is. I don't care who the president or the Congress, if this happens on another country and the normal migration of back and forth between people on a planet carries this virus, how can you possibly blame anybody here for what you can blame them for how they reacted? Blame all you want. It's not going to keep you any safer. And I think it's, it's a question of degree. Kill a million people, you'll get their attention. Kill 7,000, no one's going to care. Give me a million or I'm not going to listen. Sure. Then again, that, that million is going to have to be scattered. If, it's, if all that million is like, say, in New York City or in California, the people in the middle of the country aren't going to give a shit. Correct. Because it, it, it will have personally affected them. It's going to have to personally affect a number of people all over the place for things to change. That's exactly my point. It has to hit everyone for it to hit everyone. I write baseball, science fiction baseball. So at least today, I tried to reach out to everyone since it would have been opening day. And I said, today we're all baseball fans. So maybe, you know, when we come back, we'll remember that um, if we can't all think that we're Americans, at least we could unite and not be so vicious against the Boston Red Sox or the Yankees or the. Well, I have to be vicious against the Boston Red Sox <laughs> and the Yankees. I'm sorry, but that's in my Tigers DNA. Oh, I am oh, vicious I, against. I see, see I, I failed already. I think, <laughs> I've tried for baseball bipartisanship and it's gone. It, it just, well, on the bright side, and in Robert's defense, when baseball starts back up, he can sit behind home plate at a at a uh, Detroit Tigers game for three dollars and seventy five cents. That's right, because there's <laughs> nobody, nobody else at the game. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Before I let you go, please tell us the name of your book, where we can find it, and where we can find you on social media so we can interact with you and, you know, throw things at our screen when we disagree with you after this, uh, this broadcast. <laughs> um, I've, I've written uh, Ravenhawk, and it can be found at BHC Press and regular bookstores and most ebook e outlets. Uh, let's go to Caitlin. I'm Caitlin Brook. I write Wired, and you can find that also at the BHC Press Store, Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble. Um, and to find me online, I'm on Twitter at author Caitlin Brook. Uh, Instagram, I'm learning how to do that one. I don't take very good pictures besides my kids. But um, <laughs> and then Facebook also. I'm also pretty quiet on there. So let me know on Twitter. I'll be there. <laughs> Robert, we'll go to you next. Uh, the, my books are the Specimen series, Specimen 959. Um, it's an ongoing series, science fiction series. My, my most recent science fiction is When the River Ran Dry. Uh, that's my addiction to tech book. You can find them, again, also on BHC Press. We're all BHC folks. Uh, and at, at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Books A Million, 
you name it, it's out there. And Gary, and I, Barry Morgenstein, not Marcina Zachariah, talking about <laughs> tech. She's my <laughs> wife who had to set me up with this so my, when my eyes glazed. So um, can't take credit for my books. The last one is A Mound Over Hell. Uh, and it's available at, um, at, at, with everyone else, BHC, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere. Perfect. And look for the link at the bottom. We are doing a giveaway with BHC Press. Uh, we'll link everybody to it and the article that this will be posted in YouTube, Instagram, uh, fanboynation.com itself. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today. And I can't wait to talk to you again on a happier note other than, you know, past the uh, <laughs> pandemic status. Thank, Thank you, Robert. Right. It's been Take a pleasure. Care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Bye-bye.